Hi guys, this is Dr. Tim here with Optimize Wellness Center. Today we're going to talk about the vagus nerve and what does it mean, what does it do, how can we affect it, and how important is it really to our health, especially in this era of COVID and COVID viruses, SARS-CoV-2, etc., and how this is affecting us not only as it relates to our immune system, but also our emotional capacity, um, amongst many other things. So we're going to get into that today. All right, guys. So the vagus nerve is one of the longest nerves in our body. And it's so important and it ver offers a whole variety of different functions, for which are really important. And we need to review some of those today. Prior to what's called as the polyvagal theory, introduced in about 1994 by uh, Dr. Stefan Porges, um, who is the director of the Brain Body Center at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Prior to that, the vagus nerve was considered to have a singular neuronal pathway, and it really it went from here to there, and it did one thing, and that was it. Yet what we're now recognizing is that, in fact, it has just this huge, long list of different things that it does and how it affects people um, in so many positive and salubrious ways. And so we're going to go through some of those today. We now recognize that it connects your brain to your gut, importantly, but can affect everything uh, in association with your mood, your stress levels, digestion, heart rate, and immune system functions in addition. It may also play a role as it relates to inflammation in various chronic diseases if it's not uh, managed properly. So we're going to talk about some of these things today. And uh, so we're going to go through what is the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve's function. We're going to then review some disorders associated with the vagus nerve. And then as well as some testing and ways to stimulate the vagus nerve and make sure to provoke it adequately. Uh, and then we're going to wrap up with like, why is this all so important? Okay. All right, guys. So uh, what is the vagus nerve? Well, the vagus nerve, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the longest nerves in the body, and it runs all the way from your brain, in particular the brain stem, it's cranial nerve 10. Um, so we have 12 cranial nerves, it's the 10th of the cranial nerves, and it sends information predominantly from the gut up to the brain, about 80 to 90 percent of its passageway is this direction, and then about 10 or 20 percent of the pathway goes down and descends to various other locations throughout the body. It's known as being one of the most significantly influential nerves associated with the parasympathetic nerve system, which is all about rest and digest and repair phase associated with the nerve system, by contrast to the sympathetic nerve system. Maybe some of you have heard about that. Okay. So let's talk about some of the functions of the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve communicates, as I mentioned, from uh, it, it goes from both the gut up to the brain, and then it communicates back down. So it's bi-directional. Um, and it has motor output, meaning it has a specific um, function as it relates to movement, as well as sensory inputs uh, in addition. Ma vast majority are sensory inputs though. So the signals run up and down and they tell your brain when, when you're hungry or whether you're full. They help you to digest food through what's called as peristalsis. Um, it slows down your heart rate to create relaxation and calming effects as well as mood regulation. It activates inflammatory stress responses. And these are just a few of the most critical functions of the vagus nerve. And so it also is intimately involved in what's called as the microbiome. That's your, uh, the environment inside of your intestines and your gut. Um, gut brain access. So it's an access, a pathway between these things. And it allows these microbes, these little organisms in your gut to directly communicate with the brain. And having what we call is a, I have a gut feeling, um, and that's exactly what this is communicating, okay? 
So specifically as it relates to how it, um, it functions relevant to our brain, it has duties that affect mood as well as uh, storing memories and the strength of our ability to be able to do this, as well as a bonding connection with other human beings through the release of certain chemical neurotransmitters. So there's a growing amount of evidence that seems to show and indicate that stimulating the vagus nerve has an effect specifically on severely depressed individuals, as well as bipolar um, issues with some individuals. And this is through an electronic stimulation that gained FDA approval back in 2005. Um, and it's still used today for certain conditions and it has some promising um, hope and outlook for things like epilepsy as well as Alzheimer's disease in addition. So beyond the mental aspects and the memory components, it also helps to affect our ability to be able to hear, to talk or phonate, um, as well as to create bonds in social interactions. Um, and this is uh, through something that we call the social engagement system. Part of this theory relates on the ability of us to be able to make ourselves feel calm when we're engaged in non-threatening eye contact where we can look at each other in the eyes and this allows for our body to filter out other distracting information from our environment, our periphery, our sensory environments outside of there. So all this noise gets dampened so that we can focus on the interaction with the individual in front of us through eye contact. And it also affects the muscles in our face as well as in our ears and in our larynx associated with our voice box um, to be able to control not only facial expression but also vocal tone and tonicity. So we also talk about tone is associated with vagal tone and we're going to get into that in a moment. So in summary, you know, the signals run up and down the vagus nerve and they impact various parts of the body including the brain, the throat, the heart, the uh, sorry, the heart, the lungs, as well as our gut. And in the brain in particular, it's affecting our moods and our ability to store and relate to our memory patterns. Uh, also lung and breath function, promoting healthy digestion, proper blood sugar control, um, helping the gut bacteria in our microbiome to be able to communicate then bidirectionally again back up to the brain through that access we were talking about before. Limiting inflammation in the body, as well as important, excuse me, important components regulating our immune system. So the vagus nerve disorders are varied because of there being so many places where the vagus nerve goes. And so there obviously can be many different kinds of maladies or diseases or ailments associated with the vagus nerve. So often this is um, diagnosed through utilizing things like MRI, but we can also look for other kinds of traits and responses and see how well they're functioning. So um, this can be things, uh, so sorry, the, the various disorders can trigger symptoms including the loss of gag reflex. So we put a, a tongue depressor in the throat, back of the throat, uh, our inability to be able to have a gag reflex would mean we have a dampened nerve, uh, vagus nerve function or low vagal tone. Hoarseness or whispering or nasally voice, in, and that could be also an indication of this. Difficulty swallowing called dysphagia uh, or heart arrhythmias. This is an erratic heartbeat due to a discoordinate neurologic signal. Um, changes in blood pressure. So blood pressure is where the blood exits the heart and then it's starting to go out through the rest of the body and our ability to create a sustained and very um, uh, calm blood pressure through the body. And so if we see large fluctuations, this can be one indicator. Decreased production of stomach acids. Uh, so our inability to be able to digest foods properly. Esophageal motilial 
excuse me, motility disorders. And so this is things like acid reflux or GERD, where we can't get motility or movement in the esophagus appropriately. Anxiety, depression, irritable bowel syndrome, um, gastroparesis, this is a delayed gastric emptying. So we, we get food and we digest parts of it, but it's not releasing and emptying so that we can defecate and go number uh, one and two. Or it could be associated with some other specific disease processes like Wallenberg syndrome, Horner syndrome, um, nerve palsy, and pseudomembranous paralysis, as well as cerebral palsy. Wow, that was a long list. So you can see how important the vagus nerve is, and it affects so many things in our body. So these symptoms you experience may depend upon the location of where it may have affected you in your vagus nerve, referring again to low vagal tone. Most of these symptoms are uh, underactive nerve activity, but we can have some situations where we're overstimulated. And this is really where we overreact to things in our environment, like stress or extreme heat, um, or we have a severe change in blood flow uh, or emotional distress. All of these can cause a sudden drop of heart rate and subsequently blood pressure. And this is what is called vasovagal syncope, fainting. So we, we uh, have a very significant drop in that blood pressure and then we faint and that's vagal, excuse me, vasovagal syncope. So the nerve, this is so important for us to be able to be able to observe this and then figure out how to address these things as well. So testing, so as I mentioned earlier, testing can be performed through utilizing an MRI, but we can also use some other imaging techniques where we can monitor the movement of various areas since there's a motor component associated with the vagus nerve. So there's some methods that we would do this, and we can do some of these in office without any really specialized tools. So for example, as we mentioned earlier, if we were to stick a tongue depressor in there and there was no gag reflex, this would indicate to us that there's low vagal tone, and so we may need to work on that. We can also measure it through the response by using something called HRV, or heart rate variability. This is the variability of the um, space in between breaths in the peaks and trough of how we breathe. So we use typically technology to be able to measure and monitor this, and that can provide us some really important information. So higher um, heart rate variability indicates also higher vagal tone, which is associated with greater levels of health and mort uh, mortality reduction or disease reduction and symptom reduction, all of which are associated with um, higher amounts of vagal tone or heart rate variability. So we wanna be able to help our body to be able to address and adapt adequately to stress. And with higher levels of vagal tone, we can do this uh, much better. So these kinds of things, uh, if we had low heart rate variability, that also is associated with our inability to be able to recover properly from stress. And since stress is one of the most common components with any disease, any ailment, any issue that you may have, our enhanced ability to be able to adapt appropriately to stress would mean that we have a better ability to be able to maintain our health and our immunity, okay? So in summary, you know, the doctors can use a variety of techniques to be able to measure vagal tone. And this is really important as it relates to our ability to be able to stay healthy. So you might want to seek out a doctor who can help you through that process. All right. So now that we measured it, now we have to talk about how to stimulate the vagus nerve. So again, the vagus nerve runs along here and it runs then down through and goes past the lungs and the heart, and then it goes into all the structures associated with our gastrointestinal tract for the most part. And so, in fact, there's actually two, because it comes on both sides of the body, which is quite unique for us to have that bilateral communication. 
So uh, again, you know, we want to be able to make sure to stimulate this appropriately because it can affect so many conditions, things like depression, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, migraines, poor digestion, IBS, obesity, etc. So this can be a really important thing for us to do. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we can utilize what's called as electrical stimulation or, or uh, vagal nerve stimulation, where they put, uh, they embed usually underneath the skin, typically. Um, a, a device that releases a small impulse, fortally, uh, typically at 40 hertz, and this will stimulate the vagus nerve um, to be able to achieve these enhanced functions of increasing our heart rate variability and increasing our vagal tone, creating positive effects in the body. But we can also know that you know it, it, there's a variety of locations where this nerve function should allow for our body to work properly. So looking for these may give us clues as to where we would want to stimulate. So the muscles associated with the constriction of our pharynx, the rami pharyngii, these are muscles that help with phonation. Also behind our eyeballs, um, the radix oliculomotaria muscles are associated with vagal nerve um, function as well. Then the soft and hard palate. So we've got uvula, and then we've got soft and hard palate on either side of that. Is associated with the nervous plantinius muscles. And then the surface in the ear canal and the lobe are also uh, related to the vagus nerve, as well as our tongue. So, oh my gosh, that's a lot of areas that are associated. So there are a variety of techniques, and I'm not going to go into all the details associated with these, but I am going to review many of these techniques. One of the things that research has shown us is when we get into, uh, we switch our temperature and we get into a colder temperature, this tends to stimulate the parasympathetic rest and digest part of the nerve system, which is predominantly associated with the vagus nerve. So we can do this through um, doing things like a cold plunge or in the shower or even putting our face in ice cold water can affect and create this same stimulation. There's also specific breathing techniques, particularly known as diaphragmatic breathing. So we have our diaphragm that separates our upper organs from our guts, more or less. And it creates a shelf here. Breathing down into the base of our lungs, doing diaphragmatic breathing, can be a technique to be able to stimulate this causing a physical tractioning of the nerve, in fact. Then yoga and tai chi and qigong techniques are also known to have really positive stimulus on the vagus nerve. And this is through the movement patterns as well as um, the way in which they're able to create slow breathing. Now, speaking of uh, breathing patterns, singing, chanting, humming, gargling are all known to be able to stimulate the vagus nerve. And this is through a variety of mechanisms, but there's something about how you hold a tone and it stimulates phonation in the back of the neck here. And we get a physical stimulus associated with the vagus nerve through doing that. There's also some harmonic capacities of hertz and so forth of how this works. And hence, there's a number of different faiths and beliefs that use chanting and um, singing the uh, sound om. And this tends to be able to provoke this as well. Then we can do things like meditation and positive social interactions. So meditation has long been known to be able to create a loving kindness. And there's loving kindness technique meditation, which enhances vagal tone. Also through social positive connections, we can promote something called oxytocin, which is also associated with vagal tone. And so by giving compassion and goodwill, we can enhance this even without any contact in addition. Laughter, so making sure that we have an opportunity to laugh creates this triggering where we laugh and it creates a motion here and the, actually even the sounds and the hertz associated with that seem to be associated, at least the research is showing that it's associated with vagal tone and enhancements of that. Physical activity, so we can even do some mild exercises um, where we can enhance vagal tone by doing uh, movements. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Tai Chi, Qigong, and these kinds of yoga techniques are some of those. 
But even getting into the zone, jogging, can be another method. People often find that when they're swimming for long periods of time, they get into a zone. So there's a variety of ways to be able to stimulate this. And um, we can also stimulate the gastric motility by doing this in this causative positive effect. Then we can do some physical stimulation. Chiropractic care is long known to be able to have specific adjusting techniques, which are well suited for not only assessing, but then stimulating the vagus nerve. Since it runs all along this area, we have a great ability to be able to do this, and it coincides with uh, chiropractic technique or, or excuse me, philosophy associated with dampening what's called a sympathetic. This is the stress um, part of the nerve system associated with running from the bear, fight or flight. So dampening that allows for space for the parasympathetic rest, digest, and repair phase, which is associated with the vagus nerve. All right. So then we can also do things like acupressure and massage, where we can also run along these same segments. And so that can be really positively affecting things. Even it, way back hundreds and hundreds of years ago, acupuncture has long been known to be able to stimulate the vagus nerve because it actually goes to specific nodes and crossroads where we can get heightened responses through just a very minor and very painless stimulation. So acupuncture is another really terrific technique to be able to do this. All right, so now we can also talk about things that we can ingest. Like since we know that our microbiome and our gut have an access that talks to the vagus nerve in our brain, well, we want to make sure to provide the right kind of diversity in that microbiome so that we have a diverse response to things. So that means using probiotics can be really beneficial, creating bacterial diversity in our guts. So we can use a variety of different kinds of, of these. Spore-based tend to work really well. Also utilizing omega-3 fatty acids. This is super important because this helps to provide protection around what's called as the myelin sheath. This is the sheath along the nerve, and it creates a protective layer around that. So EPA and DHEA, which are specific kinds of omega-3 fatty acids, are super beneficial and powerful for giving the nutrients necessary for our brain and the synapses, but also protecting the nerves, and in particular, the vagus nerve. All right. So then we can talk about, well, why is the vagus nerve so important? Well, we talked about so many areas in which it affects in our body. And of course, that gives some credence as to how important it is. It's also the primary nerve associated with the parasympathetic nerve system, which is really where our body should be 80 or 90 percent of the time should be in parasympathetics, rest, digest and repair. Not all amped up running from the bear. All right. But unfortunately, many of us spend a lot of time running from the bear, and so we need to find ways to modulate that, and the vagus nerve is a really important way to do that, okay? So we can also talk about that pathway between the gut and the brain, that access, microbiome, gut, brain, access. That's another really important area. So when properly stimulated, the vagus nerve can result in, it can turn on what's called as neurogenesis. And this is creating and building and sprouting new neurons and new neuronal pathways in the brain. Super important. So we can stave off things like Alzheimer's, dementia, and other kinds of degenerative brain diseases. It can release specific kinds of enzymes in proteins like prolactin, vasopressin, and oxytocin, all important for calming us down, regulating our breath, and creating a sense of peace and harmony with ourselves and others, reducing stress levels. It can sharpen our memories, stimulating the vagus nerve, strengthens our memory pathways and our ability to be able to hold on to them, utilizing uh, norepinephrine into the, what's called as the amygdala, which is a certain area of the brain where we store memories in particular. It can uh, also um, fight inflammation in the body, help to resist high blood pressure. It's a, um, the heart's natural pacemaker in addition, creating <coughs> in particular... <coughs> excuse me, in particular in the right atrium, it's helped 
to use what's called as acetylcholine to release, to create the slowing of the pulse, creating the proper heart rhythmic pattern. It can block, block hormones uh, like cortisol, which are associated with stress and oxidative um, damage into the brain and the body. It blocks systemic uh, body-wide inflammation, and so this is associated with poor healing patterns if we have too much inflammation. And so this can really help through the presence of certain kinds of positive cytokines, as well as something called tumor necrosis factor. It helps to overcome depression and anxiety, for allows for us to sleep better. It can raise our levels of human growth hormone. It can turn down allergic responses. It can lower our chances of being affected negatively from stress and tension headaches. It can help spare uh, and help with the growth of our mitochondria, which are the powerhouses for every cell, giving it energy. And the key to maintaining optimal energy levels and by not harming the DNA and the RNA of these cells. It can affect our overall ability for a longer life, health span, and even a more energetic and lively, um, lo energetic livelihood, excuse me. Neurotransmitters um, in particular are important here. Acetylcholine will elicit this vagal uh, response and it, it's, it helps us to breathe properly in our lungs. And importantly, this is one of the reasons why Botox is really challenging is because while Botox can be utilized for cosmetic purposes, and some people utilize it to dampen headaches, it also actually is potentially dangerous because it disrupts the production of the acetylcholine. All right, and then we talked about uh, vagal syncope. And so this is the response to stress where we get overstimulated through the vagus nerve and our heart rate drops and we may pass out, okay? So there's so many different ways in which the vagus nerve are really important for us and it's intertwined in all these systems of the body. Identifying the dysfunction is really important and working with a doctor who can help you through that. And then identifying also ways that we can help to improve your vagus nerve function in enhancing and in stimulating it appropriately. And so having someone to work alongside with you to be able to monitor that would be really a good idea. And so finding someone who can work with you on that um, would be an important goal. All right, guys, so we have gone through so much here today. I'm so grateful that you spent the time uh, listening in and learning about the vagus nerve. We're gonna be giving another talk about this and even further, but I wanted to make sure to share this information with you. Some of the information I talked about today is actually found in some of our other videos, and I encourage you to look at each of those in addition. Write some comments below if any of this was interesting or valuable to you, and we'll make sure to get back to you as well. Guys, thanks so much for taking the time. Make sure to subscribe to our page, share it with others. Sharing is caring. We'll look forward to catching up with you soon. Dr. Tim with Optimize Wellness Center. Thanks.